welcome to the Think Like a Hacker webinar. I am Lashmia. I am the product manager here at Mayhem. And here today is Josh, our VP of Developer Advocacy. And I'll let him tell you more about that when we get to that point. But we are here to help you guys think like a hacker and navigate our cybersecurity world that, in the current state that we are in today. So if you have questions, feel free to either ask in the chat or in the Q&A boxes. Either one is cool. And then when we get to the question section, we'll start answering those as well. So feel free to, you know, ask those questions as they come to you. you ready, Josh? Anytime. All right. Well, hey, thanks everyone for hopping on and taking some time with us today. Um, this is about thinking like a hacker. And it's not just about thinking like a hacker. It's about how do we start to learn from what hackers do and start to put that into practice as cybersecurity practitioners, DevSecOps practitioners, application security practitioners in our organizations. Um, so this is going to be a mix of kind of the background on what and why and going into some tactical recommendations. Now, look, we have a product we make. I'm not here to show you our product. I'm not here to demo you our product and be like, listen, this is why it's the best. Now, the story I'm telling you, hey, we've got a product that helps make that reality. But the things I'm going to talk about today are some core principles that independently of how you implement this in your organizations from a tool selection standpoint, adopting these are going to make you more secure and better prepared for cyber attacks as they come. So let's talk about this a little more specifically. What we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about the problem, thinking like a hacker, I want to talk about some questions. Nothing complicated. Who am I and what gives me some knowledge about this? So here at Foral Secure, I do a couple of things. I help shepherd our product roadmap. I lead our developer relations and advocacy programs. And also I work very heavily across everything we do marketing. I'm a ex developer, ex QA engineer, ex DevOps engineer and manager and then a marketer at a series of DevSecOps, DevOps type companies. I have a career of trying to figure out how we make developers more productive while still meeting the security and compliance requirements that are just an essential fact of life in today's digital world. So that said, let's get started. Like 10 years ago, I was shifting things left. And I was shifting things left because, hey, this was going to help us fix issues before they reach production. And we shifted a bunch of cybersecurity left. We shifted a bunch of IT tasks left. We shifted a bunch of operations tasks left. And you know, last year, Invicti surveyed a bunch of AppSec professionals and developers. And 41% of AppSec professionals and 32% of developers say that, hey, we find things in production, and sometimes that takes upwards of five hours a day. So what we're really saying is, well, we shifted stuff left, but we're still finding a bunch of things in production. Well, okay. Well, seems weird, but hey, okay. And so then 80% of teams say that their app stack tools have false positive rate of over 50%. And I always struggle with what stats put on this slide because any application security survey anywhere is going to have numbers pretty similar to this, where the false positive rate is 45% plus. And you can see here that a lot of folks say that they have 75% plus false positives. So, okay, we're still finding a bunch of things in production and developers and AppSec teams get a lot of noise from the tools they use today. All right. Well, it's probably no surprise then that 75% of teams say they sometimes or often skip security checks to ship faster and meet deadlines. You know, and hey, maybe the 25%, you know, it's not true that they lied on the survey. That's just, that's my snarky commentary. But let's be honest, if security is challenging and dev teams are KPI'd on shipping features that drive customer retention, that drive revenue it's going to be hard for them to always follow security processes. And this is still a challenge. So like, I want to take a step back because 
look, we've been shifting security left to help developers out for you know, 15 years now. So what did we shift left? Well, we shifted left a lot of things around posture. We shifted left stack analysis, dynamic testing, source code analysis, S-bombs, things like that. But we really kept the activity piece of application security and you know, called it pen testing and kept it on the right post-production. So now what's happened is traditional SOC alerts, well, we shifted all the noise to that left. Well, we shifted left scanning for a bunch of known vulnerabilities. But we didn't actually make finding and fixing faster. We just made it happen earlier in the process. And so what we've done is, sure, we can find and fix earlier in the process. And that does mean fewer issues for each production. But we've slowed down how code gets released by sheer virtue of the noise that has shifted left along with application security. Now, at the same time, I hear this pain from our customers every day. And the world we live in has some really hard asymmetries with cybersecurity as well that compound this world. So I want to talk about those because, okay, we've overwhelmed developers with noise and a lot of false positives, hard to always follow security processes. We're still just kind of scanning for posture. Hey, are there risks here instead of understanding is there actual exploitable behavior? And meanwhile, attackers need one weakness. You know, I got, I got, I got the Death Star figure here in, in the background. Like, this is just the truth. As defenders, we have to do our best to keep as many different attack vectors secure and minimize our exposure. But if an attacker can find one weakness, they're in. And that's challenging. That's challenging to constantly play defense when just one weakness can lead to an exploit, can lead to a breach. And you know, cybersecurity, like as an aside, we don't get recognized enough for what we're doing to protect all the paths. Cybersecurity is always in the news for not protecting one. Well, what about the other 500 that we successfully protected? This is an asymmetry of how cybersecurity works and how it's perceived today. The other piece, especially with AppSec, is there are 570 developers for every cyber professional. So either we have to scale the knowledge and exposure of AppSec professionals to what's going on in my code base, what's going on in my pipelines, how are things deployed, what's the attack surface of my apps, or we have to deputize developers to participate in the security process more effectively. This is kind of where shift left started. It was, hey, this is starting to become a problem. You know, I don't know what these numbers were 10 years ago, but, but probably you know, 1 to 100, 1 to 200. And so we started saying, well, let's help get developers to do some of this. But we just shifted security tasks left onto developers instead of thinking, what's the right way to get developers engaged? The third piece here, though, is you just can't stay ahead. And this is the real frustrating part about application security. Monday. You do everything right. Your S bomb's like, hey, there's no vulnerable components here. You had some audit your code. Yeah, no, it's perfect. The third party did some pen testing. You did all the different things. Like, you're sure you're not doing all this. And you release a new version of your app. And Tuesday, an attacker does some, you know, reverse engineering, fuzz testing, active pen testing, and figures out a way to exploit a previously unknown weakness and vulnerability. Well, it was a zero day. And then Wednesday, you're pushing your vendors, oh, hey, this was introduced in a third-party library. How do we, we get a patch for this? You're triaging impact, you're containing breaches, you're spending that five plus hours a day reacting to production incidents. But you did everything right. You ran all the tools you had and they said, yeah, you're safe. Go release, go ship. This is the scenario that every single time I talk to cybersecurity leaders, every single time I talk to CTOs, every single time I talk to developers, I hear one of these stories. 
and it's either too many false positives, it's we did everything right, and then there was a breach on a zero day, it's I don't get any recognition for all the ways we're improving our you know, risk posture. It's these stories and these stories collectively that are kind of the modern state of AppSec. And it's, look, we've made a lot of improvements over the past decade, but this isn't a really great place for anyone involved in the process. And what I hear day in and day out from developers and AppSec professionals is they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed and they feel like they're constantly playing catch up. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit. Now let's talk about what an attacker does because it's not the same. It's close, but it's not the same. So, okay. When we all hear about zero day in the news and uh, guess what? There's been a new hack. Log for shell, log for J, oh no. What actually happened there? And I want to start this by kind of showing off like the landscape of tools. So, you know, forgive me my Gartner quadrant -y type graph. I promise you it's not, I, mean, I don't remember what those axes are, but if we think about how AppSec works today, there's behavior and pattern matching. Are we seeing things that match patterns that we know are vulnerable? Is there a library here that has no vulnerabilities in it? And then there's, is your application behaving in a way that exposes a weakness that is vulnerable? And then there's known and unknown. Hey, someone already cataloged this CVE. It's known vulnerability. Maybe there's a patch for it, maybe there's not. And then we are finding new ways to break things. You know, you look at this. When I talk to folks today, hey, do you have SCA? Yes. Majority of the customers I talk to have SCA. Do you have SAS? Yeah, most of them have SAS. Some of them have gas or I asked one of those two. Do you have an S-bomb? It's becoming more of a thing. What's your pen testing program? Well, you know, we do it once a year as far as compliance. Okay. Do you do things like fuzz testing, use ML in for behavioral testing? No, not really. Yeah, you know, we do it every once in a while. Now, some folks, we got requirements to do this, but for the most part, folks are really focused on how do I use technologies that match patterns to tell me where I'm potentially vulnerable. And that's how you get those 50% false positives. And what's more is you also get the, well, yeah, that library is used in my code, but it doesn't actually get leveraged at runtime, time. And so it's just in the code, but it's not actually on the attack surface, which again, slows development down. Now, what's really interesting about this set of technologies is if you think about a couple of hacks recently, and I'll you know, talk through these a bit, talking about Heartbleed or talking about, you know, I don't know if anyone saw this. It's a, you know, we'll send these slides out afterwards. It's, it's a cool video here. Drone flies by a Tesla, unlocks it. How did it do that? Just, it, didn't, it didn't need to know anything. The attackers figured out a way with no knowledge to go actually exploit the Tesla systems. Now, been patched, been fixed, but there's a reason both of these are in the top right. And almost every successful cyber attack against applications comes from tools in this quadrant. It comes from techniques in this quadrant that are focused on understanding behavior and understanding how to trigger previously unknown behaviors that lead to previously unknown vulnerabilities. Now you might say, well, don't attackers want low hanging fruit? Yeah, they do. But typically speaking, those aren't the attacks that cause the most damage. It's the ones where you don't know they got in and you don't know they got in until you're running around doing costly patching. So if attackers are using these techniques to identify behavior in your apps and focus on the unknowns, seems a little odd that, that we're using primarily the tools on the left side here to defend against them. Yeah, best defense, good offense maybe? I don't know. So you think about an attack, it's, hey, how do you access an application, map the attack surface, and then breach it, 
How do you determine the underlying weakness and vulnerability that made that possible? And then how do you weaponize that to create an exploit against it and escalate your control and get to your objectives? Hey, do you want to hold things ransom? Do you want to you know, exfiltrate data? This is the process that happens. Now, this is not what we really do right now. What we do is we say, here's a bunch of stuff that may or may not be on the attack surface. And here's what we know about the known CVEs that map that. Have fun, go. So what's the solution? And so this is where like, okay, we've talked a little bit about the challenges. Talked a little bit about, hey, there seems to be a disconnect between the tools we use to defend and what hackers use to attack. And breaking this down, okay, three easy steps to how attacks work. What can we as AppSec professionals do? Well, punchline, think like a hacker. That's, that's title of this. We have to approach our applications by looking at how they behave when they're running and trying to breach the attack surface. We have to then understand the underlying weaknesses and vulnerabilities that allow those breaches to happen. And then step three is an exploit. It's remediate. But this is the approach that allows us to play the same game that an attacker uses by thinking like a hacker. And, and again, I, I'm using an attacker and hacker a little interchangeably here, which I shouldn't be. Like hacking is a technique. Attackers are bad actors that use a lot of times hacking techniques in pursuit of bad outcomes and goals. But on the white hat side, we should be hacking our own code. We should be hacking our own applications and learning and using those techniques in our pipelines. So why do we want to do this? Because it's really easy for me to say, oh, well, look, just do this. Easy. But there's a really big shift that has to happen in how we talk about cybersecurity and how we talk about application security. What you see today is reports on vulnerabilities. You've got a thousand CVEs. Well, great. What do I do about that? We need to make a shift and we need to focus on what's exploitable and not what's vulnerable. Because you're trying to reduce risk. You're trying to minimize the likelihood of a successful cyber breach. You don't do that by trying to fix every single vulnerability. You try to do that by fixing the ones that are most likely to be exploited and weaponized against you. Now, you're like, oh, wow, exploitability versus vulnerability. Like, I'll be honest, a lot of times I say this to folks and they're like, yes, duh. Like, if we could do that, we'd have been doing that already. We live in a slightly different world in the past three, four years than we did 10 years ago when we started shifting things left. 10 years ago, people were like, oh, fellas testing, a lot of behavioral testing. Wow, well, no, really, it's throwing 100 random tests at a wall and seeing if something breaks. And then, oh, guess what? We got better compute. So now we're throwing 1,000 random tests at a wall and seeing what breaks. Those have gotten, that's gotten better, smart, faster. At the same time, machine learning, we can now develop algorithms that take large scale test results and use that to generate new and interesting test cases and inputs. You know, I, I call it symbolic execution, like, hey, that's a secret sauce thing for us, so I like putting it on here. It's a machine learning technique. It allows us to abstract the ways that applications work and execute against the abstractions versus trying to find every single potential variable that could fit in. And again, AI ML, like generative AI, it's in the news these days. All that's doing is saying, hey, this learns from itself every single time. Well, we can do the same thing in cybersecurity. If you're running 100 tests, 1,000 tests a minute, and then you're feeding the results of those back in, here's what I did, and here's how the application behaved, you can use generative algorithms to create new test cases, create smarter ones, create ones that expand your code coverage. 
and start to do these things at scale. And this is another piece. Compute has gotten cheaper and scale has gotten cheaper. So whereas five years ago trying to do this, great, maybe you get 100 tests every 10 minutes and you're running on a, with a team of 20 people. Now you can run thousands of tests a minute, tens of thousands of tests a minute at global scale for teams of thousands of developers and get real meaningful results saying, this is a way your application is exploitable. So it's all possible. And again, like, man, it's a platform we make, it's tool that does this, or it's solution that does this. But you can do these things regardless of technology. What this looks like in practice though, it's taking the focus on exploitability and doing a few key things in your processes on how you address security issues. First and foremost, you focus on vulnerabilities with proven exploits. If there's not a known exploit against a vulnerability, it's not a priority. Exploitability is how you prioritize, not vulnerability. Not what ifs, but real, actual, how is this exploitable in my environment? This is the first and most important piece. If you're trying to prioritize on a list of vulnerabilities or buckets of categories of CVSS scores, that's helpful, but you need to understand whether or not something is exploitable in your environment and use that to prioritize how you fix so that when you fix, you know those fixes make you safer in a quantifiable fashion. If you're not doing that, you can't measure the outcome of your cybersecurity. You're just waiting for the next breach where you get your hand slapped and says saying, we found 100 exploitable paths. We fixed 99 of these to prevent 99 potential attacks. That's the type of success metric that you want to be sharing because that's amazing. The 99% success rate, that's great. Define risk based on application behavior and posture. And this ties into the first one. It's not an issue of could anyone exploit this anywhere? It's an issue of how is my application running? If something's only exploitable via the network and you're running in an air gapped environment, you don't need to care about it. Bold statement, I know. But how can this be used against me in my application, in my architecture? That's the conversation that needs to happen. And a lot of times you hear this from developers. Oh, well, you know, it, it doesn't run that way. It doesn't run that way. Sadly, it's not, yeah, it's not a real excuse. Like, what is the architectural decision that minimizes the exploitability chance? And how do we make sure that AppSec, Dev, CTO, CISO are all clear on that? That's the type of information that needs to be surfaced up and across teams. The third piece, automate testing and triage. Automate testing and triage, automate testing and triage. Hopefully a lot of folks have seen, you know, GitHub Copilot, right? Oh, hey, we can write some code. And, you know, different, different folks playing around with like AI models that, you know, write some lines of code for you. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying go use ChatGPT to run cybersecurity for you. Nah. That's not really what it's there for, but modern techniques, and again, things like it, AI and ML, they can help you understand what's exploitable, and they can automate generation of test cases. Running test cases at scale, as well as generating test cases at scale, takes a lot of work off of developer plates and increases your code coverage. The more you can minimize the work developers have to do to write tests and the work developers have to do to triage results, the better. When there's a vulnerability that's detected, before that gets shipped to a developer, you need to be sure that that's reproducible. And you need cybersecurity platforms that say to you, here's how to reproduce this in your environment against your application, because otherwise, you're playing this game where developers spend most of their time figuring out what to do about it. How do I go make this work? How do I see this vulnerability for me before they can even get started on prioritization? I was talking to a dev leader the other week and you know, they run, run an e-commerce business. 
fairly large. And the team spends more time triaging security issues than fixing security issues. And you know, you kind of think about it, like, that yeah, makes sense. Re research takes more time than code execution a lot, a lot of times, or code development. But what if you could get all that time back to fix more issues? That's the goal. That's what we want to get to is developers don't spend time trying to reproduce security results. They spend time fixing proven security results. So I'm talking about all these things is like, hey, developers got to do this, developers got to do this, developers got to do this. But really, this is ongoing. You continuously test your application behavior. And again, application behavior. This is not your once a year pen test you know, to make sure you're compliant. This is how can my application's behavior, anomalous activity, crashes, can they be weaponized against me? And if so, how am I feeding that information back for someone to go patch and remediate that? This has to happen continuously. And you know, does continuously mean someone runs it once a day? Does continuously mean, hey, you're running a constant service testing this? Like, eh, your mileage may vary there, but these techniques, you got to have everywhere in the pipeline because it's not just enough to try and catch things before they're shipped. It's making sure that you're constantly maximizing the coverage of your application behavior once you've shipped as well. So those are kind of like, hey, here are the things you need to focus on. Here are the things you need to change about what you're doing to start thinking about, okay, how do hackers approach finding vulnerabilities and weaponizing them so that I can find vulnerabilities and remediate them. Summarizing it up, it's use the techniques and tools of attackers in your CICD. You know, whether you want to go leverage some open source, you know, old school like fuzz testing stuff, whether you want to use more modern app set platforms that use ML to do behavioral testing, you want to push those into your CICD. And again, things that use ML, they can take a long time, so don't run them in band, don't block your build space on it, but find the results. You want to automatically generate test cases. It's a lot better to automatically generate as many tests as you can so your developers don't have to write as many. Developers only get validated results. Don't make developers struggle to reproduce security issues because then, well, can I not reproduce it because it's not real or can I not reproduce it because I'm not doing the right thing? And Success isn't no critical CVs. I, I hear this all the time when I talk to security leaders and dev leaders. Well, you know, we just eliminate anything critical and then we ship. It's about fixing exploitable CVs. It's about knowing at any given point, hey, this build had 10 exploitable vulnerabilities in, them, in it. We fixed nine. Hey, this had 15 and we fixed 10. Hey, over the last year, we've identified 200 exploitable vulnerabilities in our application and we fixed all of them. Those metrics show cybersecurity, you know, AppSec development, those show a contribution to an improved security posture. And it allows us to start reframing how to measure application security. It's not just about avoiding a breach, it's about proactively implementing fixes that stop future breaches. And by focusing on exploitability, you're able not only to deliver safer software, and usually faster too, but you're also able to show security's proactive contributions in a meaningful way, rather than just waiting to get slapped on the wrist the next time there's an attack. So that's my sort of, hey, here's how we need to think about this. Here's how you start trying to implement this. I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to talk a little more tactically about like, what does this look like in practice if folks want? Um, you know, I'll just kind of close it out. Again, shameless plug. Ma'am, integrates in your CI CD, integrates in your build process, integrates in your IDEs. And it is designed to run your application, understand its behavior, and try its best to break it. Self-learning algorithms to constantly expand coverage, and every single result is validated, delivered to a developer with, here's a way to reproduce it, and here's a regression test to prove that it got fixed so that folks aren't spending time on triage, 
You're not spending time on false positives, you're spending time fixing exploitable issues. Um, you get more information on AM security, ask questions. And yeah, thanks for listening. I hope that was informative and gives you the start of thinking about how to make some pivots and some changes in application security measurement, philosophy, and eventually implementation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, that was actually really informative. And I actually have a question um, before the questions start. Um, <laughs> I know, awesome. right? Yeah. So when you see the alerts about, oh, there's a new CTE that's been discovered and stuff, and like the panic that a lot of people put into it, what is your first thought when you see them? So, you know, and I'll, and I'll kind of answer this two ways because it, it's, been a, it's been a while since I've been in the hot seat in those scenarios. And so my first reaction these days is a lot of empathy going out to everyone impacted. You know, I, the, you know, you gotta look at my LinkedIn, the majority of folks I know are in development and cybersecurity. Their lives, and let's be honest, their family's lives get royally impacted and thrown into an upheaval every time there's a new like front page news zero day. Um, and so a lot of empathy first and foremost, because it's, uh, it's not easy and a lot of times they take a lot of a lot of flack for doing everything right because mm -hmm. again like it's a zero day folks do everything right so there's that the second piece to kind of tell you what i hear from our customers a lot is it's how do i know how i'm impacted mm -hmm. And that I think, you know, I think the industry is starting to do some things with S bombs that are, you know, I'm not going to say they're fixing everything. And to be honest, I think they contribute a little bit to some of the problems I talked about earlier on. But that's starting to give security professionals and leaders a quick way to say, where am I impacted versus spending the first day in a state of panic trying to figure out what the impact is. And what I hear from folks is that's the number one worry every time there's a new you know, front page headline zero day, it's, oh no, oh no, how does this impact me? How does this impact me? And so I think at least there's some progress towards solving that. So it's a, just an issue of, okay, let's go fix, let's go fix, which is significantly better than where we were a year ago. I understand. And I agree, it definitely leading with empathy. So one of the questions that we got is how can machine learning help us prevent zero days? So, and, and, and let's be honest, like you do everything right and Tavern still find something you did. That's, that's just the truth of the world we live in today. And so when we talk about preventing zero days, like it's not about stopping every single possible attack. What it's about is using the techniques that attackers use. Mm. And when I think about machine learning, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna put my product hat on a little bit here. Like the way that Mayhem works in the background is it uses machine learning to say, okay, based on the behavior of this application, let me try something else that will exercise a new part of the code. Or based on the response I got, let me, try a different input because I think it's going to break the part of code I just went over. Those are the types of techniques that allow you to find previously unknown vulnerabilities. And a human can do that, right. but a human can't do that at scale. And so I think about machine learning as automating at rapid speed and scale, the like smarts behind doing manual pen testing and like exploring your code. It really helps you find more things that are exploitable faster. Now, some of those may link up to known CVEs, some of them may not, but it's really about unlocking the scale. And unlike sort of pattern matching based security scans, it allows you to not like you don't actually care about is this known or unknown. You care about the behavior of your application and is it exploitable. So I think it unlocks that, which helps you get ahead of attackers. But again, you can't prevent zero days. I anyone who says, "Hey, you're never going to get impacted by a zero day again," like 
that's not true. <laughs> right. Pardon the things you can get your trusted images, you can do all that. All you're doing is you're buying into wall gardens. Right. I agree. And so I have one more question. Um, in your opinion, how often should we do security checks in you know, the process of building our apps and such? I get some flack for this one. The best security tool, the best security process, the best security solution is one that everyone follows. Mm. You know, as a as someone who's been on the vendor side for 10 years, pretty much every CEO I've worked for would say, like, no, 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 ours is the best. The fact of the matter is. You want the maximum amount of security checks that don't reduce people's adherence to them. The minute your security process starts causing folks to do workarounds, it's too much. And I've talked to a lot of CISOs who are like, no, 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 we have to mandate these things. And I don't disagree. But the reality on the ground is it's better to have a program with some weaknesses that everyone follows so you have the visibility and control and you know where your dApps are than to try to do more. People don't follow it and you don't know where your gaps are. And I realize that's a philosophical answer to what may be a very detailed question. Like you should do some in your CI CD, you should do some post launch, but you shouldn't do anything that makes people go around your security. And that's really the measurement you have to take. And sometimes that's you know, qualitative feedback by asking the teams so that you're right-sizing what you deliver as a security leader. I understand completely. Thank you for your insight. I truly appreciate that. And I think the, the um, rest of the attendees have as well. So with that being said, guys, that is the end of this month's webinar. Thank you, Josh, again for coming and actually presenting us with this wonderful hour, which we truly appreciate you. And Thank you. right back at you. <laughs> we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Thanks. Cheers.